All right, we'll go ahead and get started as uh, I'm sure a few more will be logging on and joining us, but thanks everyone for tuning in to our fifth um, webinar in uh, uh, for Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action. Um, we started this webinar series uh, just a little bit after the pandemic began and it is, uh, we've gotten a a great turnout and great participation. So thank you for joining us for today's important presentation. Um, just a couple of logistic announcements. Um, I am going to turn it over to Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action's uh, board chair, Dr. Samantha Dute, in just a second, who will um, introduce our presenter. But all participants are in listen-only mode, um, and we plan to keep it that way unless, uh, unless you request a, a to, to speak for a reason, but um, we do have a Q&A box, which you should see in the menu of your screen, probably at the bottom. Um, please feel free to put forth any questions in that Q&A box throughout the presentation today. We will answer the questions towards the end of the presentation, which will run a, a total of an hour. Um, so the uh, presentation itself around 40 minutes and that'll allow um, 15 minutes or so for questions to come in. Um, but with that, um, I'll thank you again for joining and we'll turn it over to Dr. Adu to introduce our presenter. Thank you, John. And thank you all so much for joining VCCA for the fifth webinar, webinar in our series, Health in Virginia's Changing Climate. Today's webinar, as you know, will focus on changing harmful algal blooms. In the Chesapeake Bay area, our water bodies play a vital role in our economy, um, our health, and our way of life. So changes in quality of our local waterways are of vital interest to Virginians through effects on our livelihoods, our quality of life, and our safety. We're, we are very fo fortunate to have Dr. Kimberly Reese with us today, one of the leading experts on water quality in our region. Dr. Reese is chair of the Aquatic Health Sciences Department, Graduate School of Marine Science at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science at College of William and Mary. Dr. Reese's research program conducts research on shellfish species and aquatic pathogens of humans and shellfish. A primary focus of her research is monitoring and examining the biological impacts of harmful algal blooms. Molecular genetic tools are used to do source tracking, transmission studies, and ecological experiments. Dr. Reese holds a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology from the University of Rochester and a PhD in Biochemistry, Molecular, and Cellular Biology with a minor in Genetics from Cornell University. Please welcome, welcome Dr. Reese. And Dr. Reese, uh, you are still on mute. Well, it helps to unmute. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. And welcome everybody, good afternoon. I am delighted to be able to share with you today uh, one of my favorite subjects, but also one of the things that um, concerns me most um, of what's gonna happen over the next several years. Uh, to, to the area and what's happening in Virginia. So hopefully now you can see my presentation. Um, I'm gonna talk about primarily marine, but also um, we have some very concerning things happening in our freshwaters in Virginia. So I'm also gonna talk about the freshwater blooms that we've been observing over the last um, several years in our area in Virginia. So first of all, we'll talk about what is a harmful algal bloom. And the term we use is algal, but actually these are microalgae. They're small, microscopic, dinoflagellates, diatoms, or rifidophytes, which are related to dinoflagellates and diatoms, or cyanobacteria, which are photosynthetic bacteria. And they can cause harm through production of potent toxins, which is often how we see harm to humans, or the accumulated biomass that occurs during these blooms, or when large numbers of cells are produced in the water bodies. And those blooms can call, cause low dissolved oxygen, which is clearly a problem to aquatic life, 
um, which occurs often during the biomass degradation process by uh, bacteria. And the cells can also disrupt gill functions and breathing. Those cells can also be harmful to humans by direct um, skin contact or even by um, ingestion through um, recreation in the water um, and by uh, inhalation or um, aspiration. Impacts include human and wildlife illness and unfortunately also mortality can occur. Ecosystem disruption, which is quite common with these blooms and economic losses to communities. This is a map um, from Woods Hole and these maps show the HABs or harmful algal blooms across the US pre 1972 what had been reported where you see a lot um, have been reported on the West Coast, a few on the East and Gulf Coasts, and some in Alaska and Hawaii, also in Puerto Rico, versus what has happened in the most recent years. And you see there's many, many more reports. So, of course, this you know, gives the impression that HABs are expanding, which we absolutely believe HABs are expanding, not only in the US, but worldwide. Um, there's also a better monitoring and reporting effort um, going on. So some of this um, increase in the uh, reports is due to the better monitoring. Um, but there's also climate change, which has caused some shifts in some of the organisms that we're seeing in different places where we hadn't seen before. And I'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing now in the Chesapeake Bay region which um, previously had been um, primarily in the Gulf of Mexico and in southern, um, southeastern US. Um, we have ocean um, acidification or shifts in the pH of the waters, which has, have caused also shifts in the species that are present in different regions. And of course we have anthropogenic effects, increased nutrient loading, which is occurring all over the US, but that's a particular problem for Chesapeake Bay. Um, this is what has happened across the US, um, and this is just a map of events, of HAB events, partic whoops, particularly in freshwater um, regions um, all across the United States, in ponds, streams, and rivers, um, lakes. Um, these have been recorded, and it's, it's really a serious problem in the freshwaters. And much of this is due to climate change and shifts, but also the increased nutrient loading in all of these areas. These are events that have been recorded. Um, you'll notice that these are annual number of news reports from harmful algal bloom events. Um, and the reason it's coming from the news is because unfortunately there isn't a national recording um, record now or a, uh, a database right now for these bloom events. What we're doing now as scientists is we're trying to actually um, compile all of our data from bloom events and create a national database for these bloom events. But uh, this is just showing how much there's been an increase in the national news and local news reports of bloom events since 2010. Here I'm showing a general pattern of what are bloom events or I'm going to show you in gray some of the organisms that are of particular concern in the lower Chesapeake Bay area. This is the pattern that we've observed by our monitoring and we work in conjunction with the Virginia Department of Health very closely and the Chesapeake Bay program. And this is a general pattern that after 20 years of monitoring that we've done with um, my laboratory that we're seeing in this area. Uh, so um, these are some of these names you don't need to worry about, but um, what I want you to uh, focus on are some of these organisms that we're seeing that have been a serious concern in other areas that we now are seeing in the Chesapeake Bay region and we need to be concerned about them. And we're really focusing on monitoring closely for them because we wanna be prepared. If we do start to have events, I should say right now that thankfully in our region, we have not had any shellfish 
um, contamination events that have resulted in human health illnesses that have been reported. However, we have the organisms present in the bay and we very well could have a shellfish closure that has to happen or we could have an event occur because the organisms are present and the conditions could become right for these to bloom and cause a shellfish contamination and result in a human health illness event or, shell, or requiring a shellfish closure. So we work very closely with the Department of Health. They're monitoring for this and we're monitoring for these um, events as well. So in the early spring and then again in the fall, we typically see diatoms and this um, dinoflagella called heterocapsa. Now these pro diatoms provide a very good food for our shellfish. So this is a really good time for the spawning of shellfish and for um, feeding. The shellfish are very happy at this time of year and again in the fall they're doing a lot of feeding and then they become dormant over the winter. During the summer there are a lot of uh, dinoflagellates that become more of a concern for the shellfish as well as for human consumers of shellfish. Um, there still are good um, organisms around for the shellfish to consume, but there are also these other organisms that become more of a concern. This is a diatom pseudonychia that I'll talk about a little more later that we see it's grayed out because we don't typically see any blooms. We see it in low numbers, but it produces a toxin that's a concern called demoic acid. Dinophysis, again, grayed out. We typically don't see it in large numbers, but it doesn't have to be present in large numbers to be a concern. Uh, Dinophysis produces ochidaic acid. Again, it's a possible human health effects concern. So we are watching this one and Pseudonychia very closely. Carlodinium vinificum produces carlotoxin, which can be very problematic for finfish and shellfish and has caused um, finfish and shellfish mortalities in Chesapeake Bay. Prorocentrum, there are some species that can be toxic to um, humans, produces a, a problem for both shellfish and for humans. Raphidophytes, this is another one we're watching closely. It typically produces a toxin, brevitoxin, which is a big problem in Florida with a, an organism called Karenia brevis down there. We see it in low, very low concentrations in our waters, and so far it has not been a problem, but we are watching it closely. And then we have our two very large bloomers in lower Chesapeake Bay. And these are a mouthful, Margolephidinium polycrocoides and Alexandrium monolatum. And monolatum produces a toxin that we know about called goniodomin. We just call them margin alex because that's much easier. So in the lab, we just call them margin alex, and I'll try to refer, the, refer to them as margin alex. But these are ones I'm going to focus on because these can cause large ecosystem disruption because they're very large blooms that occur in lower Chesapeake Bay. And these are some pictures, um, aerial photography from drones that we use flying from VIMS and also aerial photography by my colleague, um, Wolfgang Vogelbein, who flies over in one of the Virginia Marine Resources planes and takes some great photographs of some of this. This is the Monitor Merrimack Bridge Tunnel near the mouth of the James River, and this is in the Lafayette River down in Norfolk. And you can see these very large discolored um, streaks of Margolephidinium or Marge. We have very heavy blooms of this that have occurred almost annually, and we're just starting right now to see very heavy blooms right now in Hampton Roads of Marge. And uh, often we have citizens who have reported foul odors and respiratory irritation, just minor respiratory irritation during blooms of Marge, um, but generally very, very minor uh, effects with, with Marge blooms. Um, these are some more blooms, more images of Marge blooms. And just so you get an orientation, this is where VIMS is located on the York River. And this is right now where we're seeing the Marge blooms here, right, right here in Hampton Roads. Um, Alex was a, is a relatively newer bloom species for our area. 
there seemed to be some reports of Alex from back in the 60s where it was seen, but really didn't bloom regularly. But starting in 2007, um, it was identified blooming very, very large bloom we had in 2007 in the York River, right near Vims. It's a common bloom species along the Southern Atlantic and Gulf coasts of the US. The range seems to have expanded into the Chesapeake Bay region and we've had heavy blooms in recent years, particularly in the York Re River region, but it's recently been expanding north and south of the York River, all the way up to the mouth of the Potomac, but it hasn't gone into the Potomac. And it's now commonly seen in Virginia Beach and it's gone into the Lower James. And it was even seen in North Carolina Outer Banks. So that was interesting. And we were very excited when we first saw it, only because it has, it's very interesting. It has very long chains of cells and they look kind of like hamburgers on a chain. You can see they're flattened and they look like a bunch of hamburgers. Um, this is the Naval Weapons Station, which is very close to VIMS. And you can see these very dark patches of the uh, blooms of Alex. And these are some more, this is VIMS right here near the Coleman Bridge on the York River. Um, you can see this is taken by a drone. You can see this very large extensive bloom. And during these blooms, we've had the local aquaculturists sometimes report 70 to 80% of their oysters have died during these blooms of Alex. And so typically, whoops, what we see is um, starting in um, July through early to mid-August, which so it's right now, um, we'll see a bloom of Marge. This is um, what we see in the York River, followed by very high levels of Alex. And this is what we've seen since 2007, except in the really wet years, which were the previous two years, but this is what we've started to see this year. Not sure how the hurricane that we just had come through is going to affect it. Um, but still, as of yesterday, we were still seeing high levels of Marge. Um, so during the York River 2017, we had mixed high levels of both during the transition. So it's very interesting. So it's interesting that in the 1990s, Harold Marshall who was a professor at ODU, he since retired, he reported that Marge expanded out of the York River and moved north and south from the York River. And it seems that Alex is, seems to be doing a similar type of pattern, expanding from the York River north and south into Hampton Roads, um, Virginia Beach area, and the Lower James. And Marge started in the 90s, Alex started around 2012 to do that expansion. So it's a very interesting pattern that we've seen. So what are the roots of exposure to humans? Um, it seems to be for any of these toxins or the uh, you know, organisms that produce these toxins. And for humans, it seems to be through consumption, and often it's consumption of shellfish, occasionally finfish, and I'll talk about one um, organism toxin in particular that is um, often through finfish. But most of the time, most of these toxins, because shellfish um, tend to bioaccumulate or concentrate these toxins in their tissues, so often the um, consumption of shellfish will result in HAB poisonings. There's often accidental ingestion while recreating or swimming. And this can often happen with people who are swimming in fresh waters with the cyanobacterial blooms. And then you have drinking water. So I'll talk a little bit about, some of you may remember the problems that um, they had with drinking water in Toledo, Ohio, with the ear, uh, Lake Erie um, cyanobacterial blooms. There's also um, dermal exposure. Some people have a reaction from swimming or recreating in waters that have a bloom in them. 
um, or occupational exposure, aquaculturists or others who are in the water because that's part of what their occupation is. Scientists, for example. I'll talk a little bit about what's happened with my lab people. Um, some algae release compounds which cause an allergic or an allergic type response. May not be a true allergy, but just an irritation. Um, some toxins are actually absorbed through the skin. And then there's inhalation. Again, this is, can be recreational through being on the beach. I'll talk um, about brevitoxin, which is particularly a problem in the beaches in Florida and occupational exposure. Some toxins like brevitoxin become aerosolized and some uh, toxins are aspirated um, because of water being aspirated into the lungs. The toxins can get into the human body that way as well. Um, some emerging research um, suggests that bioaccumulation edible fish tissues can also happen in fresh water, but that's not clear. That would be the cyanotoxins, and there's a lot more research, or there's another compound that I'll talk about, BMMA, that I'll talk about a little bit that's associated with cyanobacteria. Um, so we have these two big bloomers. We have Marge and Alex, but there are all these other organisms that are what I call knocking on our door. They're actually present. Um, their toxins have, many of them, we've recently identified their toxins are present in the water, but at very low concentrations. But they're a big concern because it's quite possible that if conditions just become right, one year, they may start um, becoming a serious issue. And shellfish um, aquaculture is a huge industry in Virginia. We have the largest clam aquaculture um, in the US, and we also have the largest um, oyster aquaculture on the um, East Coast. Um, so both of those industries could be heavily impacted if one of these organisms um, decides to take off and start blooming and produce its toxin and cause contamination of our shellfish. So it is a serious issue and that's why it's closely monitored by our shellfish safety group at the Department of Health and we're watching very closely. We're doing close monitoring for these organisms as well. These are the common HAB-related human shellfish poisoning illnesses. These are the ones that are very well characterized and are very well known. Um, there's the Alexandrium tamarinds complex group, and they produce the saxitoxins. One of them, Alexandrium minutum, we've actually seen in Chesapeake Bay. So paralytic shellfish poisoning and saxitoxin production, this is one we're watching for because we are concerned about Alexandrium minutum um, becoming too happy in Chesapeake Bay and taking off. Pseudonychia species, we definitely see these. What we don't know is whether the Pseudonychia species that we have are capable of producing large amounts of domoic acid, but domoic acid has been found in Chesapeake Bay in very low concentrations by some of the monitoring that we've done, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. That causes this um, illness or syndrome called amnesic shellfish poisoning. Um, so that is another one we're very concerned about. Dinophysis species, okadaic acid, diuretic shellfish poisoning, another one that we have to watch very, very closely. Karenia brevis, thankfully we have not seen that but we have seen those refidophytes that I mentioned earlier that produce brevitoxin. So far, we've seen very low levels. So thankfully, maybe we're okay and the levels we have are low enough to not be of concern, but nonetheless, we have to watch it. And we're doing some experiments with our organisms that we have here um, that are not Karenia, but other organisms. But at the same time, our waters are warming and Karenia brevis is so far Florida and the southeast coast, but if the waters continue to warm, it's possible that the conditions here in Chesapeake Bay may favor Karenia brevis and it could move up into Chesapeake Bay. So we have to be very careful for neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. Gambier discus toxicus, ciguatoxin, 
This is a tropical, um, this is ciguatera fish poisoning. This is the one that I talk about, talked about that is primarily in finfish. And this is a tropical poisoning. So it's typically associated with anybody from Virginia who's gotten it is um, typically a traveler who's gone to um, a tropical area such as the Caribbean, Mexico, or down in Florida. Some um, fish in Florida are contaminated with Gambier discus. And so that has been a problem there. Now these toxins, depending on dose um, and depending on which toxin it is, can cause toxicity ranging from a mild irritation, to, uh, gastrointestinal mild diuretic um, problems, all the way up to some chronic issues, carcinogenic, uh, liver toxicity, neurotoxicity, to unfortunately lethality, mortality. So it depends on dose and on which toxin we're talking about. So I'll go into a little bit more detail on each of these. Paralytic shellfish poisoning or PSP, the saxitoxins. These are a whole group of toxins and there's many, many in there. Um, we have found saxitoxin in Virginia waters, but at very low levels again, but nonetheless, we're watching very carefully for it. Um, it has caused mortality in wildlife and in humans. It is a heat stable toxin. So that's a problem because ingestion can happen and, whoops, let me go back, um, usually through bivalves again, um, oysters and clams and mussels. Um, it, it occurs in dinoflagellates and in cyanobacteria. So this can be a problem in freshwater as well. So that's why we're watching it also. Minutum, but the cyanobacteria that we see in freshwater. Symptoms can begin after ingestion of the saxitoxins with ting tingling and numbness on the lips and mouth after ingestion spreading to the face and neck and to the extremities. Often, if there's a large enough dose, you can have respiratory difficulties in breathing, uh, headache, dizziness, nausea. Um, within two to 12 hours, actually, death can occur, especially if you have um, breathing difficulties and the lungs fail. Um, and 12 hours, you either have um, the symptoms gone in a few, uh, within a few hours to a few days. And unfortunately, the fatality rate is around 10% with PSP. So this is a very serious illness. And it is primarily an illness right now that's seen in New England and along the Pacific Northwest coast, some in California, but it's also seen in Florida. It's becoming more of a concern though inland with the cyanobacterial um, contamination that's occurring around the country. Amnesic shellfish poisoning is with Pseudonychia. Again, the toxin has been found in Virginia as well as the species. It's heat labile, which means it breaks down with cooking, but in shellfish, it doesn't break down. So that's a concern. This is the poisoning that if sometimes um, you may see sea lions that become disoriented. Um, there are videos, unfortunately, on some very distressed sea lions that have seizures on the West Coast with this. It causes gastrointestinal and neurological symptoms. Um, amnesic, the term for it comes because of the short-term memory loss associated with it. Um, again, many of the same uh, gastrointestinal and neurological symptoms that are associated with it. It's often found um, in, for humans, they often um, get um, amnesic shellfish poisoning from Dungeness crabs um, consumed on the West Coast, sea scallops or razor clams, bay scallops. It's, it's also found in very high levels in the viscera, fin fish, and crustaceans, but those are typically not consumed by humans, at least in the US. Can be a problem in other countries. Um, again, the New England area, um, often this is a big problem in California and on uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And also it's been a problem in the West Coast of Florida and somewhat in um, Alaska, but less of a problem there. Diuretic shellfish poisoning. Again, this is one, we found the toxin 
and we often see these species, both of them. Um, there are numerous cases now around the world, including on the US um, East Coast. It was first reported in the Netherlands. Um, it's found often in Japan now. This is very common, diuretic shellfish poisoning. Symptoms usually begin within 30 minutes to a few hours of consumption, and it's primarily gastrointestinal um, symptoms, and it's a much milder illness than some of the other ones. Um, there are a few reported, we think that most of the reports of diuretic shellfish, well, most of it goes unreported because it's a relatively mild gastrointestinal illness most of the time, and most people do not report to a physician with this illness. Neurotoxic shellfish poison is very common in Florida. This is probably the most commonly um, reported illness in Florida from, um, from a harmful algal bloom. The organism that we have very commonly in Virginia is Shacnella subsalsa, which we see in the very shallow streams coming off of the tributaries of Chesapeake Bay. Brevitoxin um, is very common a problem with inhalation of aerosols for beachgoers. And uh, many people report to hospitals with um, a problem of uh, aerosolization and breathing difficulties, asthma associated with being at the beach. And in the surf, the cells are disrupted and lice. And when they lice, they release the, the toxin. So this results um, from ingestion, you get the gastrointestinal um, symptoms that are associated with it, abdominal pain, vomiting, and diarrhea, but you have paresthesia, reversal of hot and cold temperature sensation, vertigo, ataxia-like symptoms, cough, um, bronchial spasms, and, and like I said, asthma symptoms. Um, this impacts many commercial and recreational species of fish as well as marine mammals, manatees, and dolphins in Florida. And these Karenia brevis blooms are becoming much more common in Florida. It is, it is a serious economic issue for the state of Florida. Um, they have many, many events, and they had one event that lasted, I think, more than 18 months in Florida. It was almost a continuous event on the west coast of Florida. Um, the refritophyte blooms in Virginia, and this is the one where we've seen low levels of brevitoxin in fish and water and shellfish that we collected during these blooms are very common. Um, we've seen them here. I've shown some of the places where we've collected samples with levels of brevitoxin in them. It's also happened right near Vims in Sarah's Creek, which is off of the York River. And this is a picture of some, this, these aren't leaves, these are dead fish in a creek. Um, an interesting story is that um, the woman who called us to this wanted to know if she could rake the fish out of the stream and then go swimming in it. The answer is no, do not go swimming in a place where a lot of fish have died. It's not a safe thing to do in case anybody ever asks you, no. Don't go swimming after, because of course there's bacterial degradation going on there. Please don't go swimming in that. She also wanted her grandchildren to go swimming in that. It's like, no, scared me to death. Anyway, <laughs> Ciguatera fish poisoning. Um, this is the one I was telling you about that's in the tropical um, areas. Um, it's often seen in travelers to Florida, the Caribbean, and Mexico, but it could be associated with imported fish from those areas because you see reef fish um, often carry, ah, uh, sorry about that, ciguatera toxin, grouper, snapper, mackerel, jack, barracuda, all those yummy fish that we like to eat. And unfortunately, this is an extremely serious illness. Um, it causes the gastrointestinal and neurological symptoms. Um, and it can cause, advanced cases can cause cardiovascular damage. It has a variable recovery time. It, this is um, very, very serious illness that's associated. Cigotoxin is highly toxic and, and a problem. And you can see from this map that it's primarily um, tropical, although 
Um, there have been, you know, a few cases in other areas, and that's probably due to fish being transported, but almost all of it is in the tropical areas. One of the ones that we've just started um, to look after now in the recent, er recent years is um, azosporacids. And the reason is because we found um, azosporacid toxin within the past two years using these little spats, which are little um, toxin accumulating uh, bags of resin that we put out. And this um, particular toxin was first observed in the Netherlands in 1995 in mussels that were consumed by people who became very ill. They had symptoms that were similar to diuretic shellfish poisoning, um, but the toxin was very different. We've also seen very recent reports, very first reports um, within the last two years in the Pacific Northwest, and the toxin was found by us in the Chesapeake Bay region. So now we're trying to figure out which organism is causing it, because it doesn't take very much for, um, we haven't been able to see the organism. These organisms are very small. So we're using molecular tools um, that we're trying to develop to identify which organism is actually producing this toxin. We've only seen it at a low level, so we're very glad about that, but we're wanting to make sure that we have the tools to detect it. So if it does um, become more dense, we're able to um, detect it and quantify it and know where it is and where, when it's um, blooming. I wanna come back to our other big bloomer, Alex. Um, Alexandrium monolatum produces a different toxin than the other Alexander species that produce those saxitoxins and cause paralytic shellfish poisoning. Alex produces Goniodomina A, and the human health effects of Goniodomina A are not well characterized. So we have evidence that the, there are other toxic compounds also produced, but we also have evidence of some human health effects associated with um, Alexandrium. We've had the fish and shellfish mortalities reported in the Gulf, and they've occurred in the York River region with heavy blooms. So occupational exposure has happened with my lab members, as well as with the Department of Health people who have been out sampling. It's basically respiratory and mucosal dermal irritation with just coughing, watery eyes, itching, stinging skin, mild rashes. Some people have reported some mild nausea when they're out um, or in the lab working with the cultures or working with the bloom material. Um, tingling, slightly stinging skin, that is fine after you take um, a shower. People have seemed to have been fine. So it's, you know, not a very serious, but the groups that most likely to be exposed are scientists, the aquaculturists, fishers, boaters, and swimmers. So additional exposure information is really needed for Alex. We don't really understand um, much about this. It's just beginning to be um, uncovered. But the cyanobacteria, I want to touch on this a little bit because it does concern me. There are dog deaths that have been associated with dogs that have been in these ponds that have the green um, scum cyanobacterial blooms in them because it's, these are hepatotoxins. Um, the dogs go in swimming, they ingest the water, they come out, they lick their fur. We've had some serious problems with um, veterinary issues associated with dogs being exposed, but there are also the problems with um, people uh, recreating in these waters. Um, we're getting more and more reports from Virginia waters of these cyanobacterial blooms in lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, all over the state. Um, they're sometimes called blue-green algae, which is actually a misnomer because they're bacteria, but they're photosynthetic bacteria. Most of them are in fresh water. We do have some estuarine and marine forms, and some of them get into the upper reaches of some of the estuarine rivers. We've seen cyanobacteria in the upper parts of the James River, the York River, the Rappahannock, 
um, where it's um, just um, a little bit saline, you know, it had very low, uh, very, very low salinity waters do have um, some of these cyanobacteria. Microcystis aeruginosa, this is the most common one, but there are a lot of other very, very toxic um, cyanobacteria around. This is a satellite image of Lake Erie. Um, if you remember, the, I mentioned earlier the Toledo drinking water problem. This is Florida, Lake Okeechobee. Remember when there was the big um, hoopla about um, Lake Okeechobee and the release of the water from Lake Okeechobee into the coastal areas and all of the toxicity that was associated with that that was causing problems on coastal in coastal Florida. Serious issues with Lake Okeechobee in Florida um, as well. Big hot spot in Virginia. We have a series, I've already had this year probably 12 to 14 HAB reports out of Lake Anna, um, which is to the northwest of Richmond here. Lake Anna seems to be a hot spot in Virginia for cyanobacterial blooms. And we have very, very dense blooms of cyanobacteria in Lake Anna, especially in some of these smaller coves, et cetera, up here. In these small coves, we tend to get very, very dense blooms of uh, cyanobacteria in Lake Anna. So that is a, a serious problem there. Most of the residents, I think, and visitors to Lake Anna know to stay away from those areas and don't go swimming. But sometimes you have people who don't uh, think and have their animals or they go into the water, which they shouldn't, but they do. So the toxins primarily are the hepatotoxins, microcystins, nodularin, cyclo, uh, spermopsins, ah, my mouse, sorry. Symptoms, sometimes headaches, fever, diarrhea, abdominal pain, pain, nausea, and vomiting. Dermal exposure can cause the rashes and allergic-like symptoms. Liver damage from um, exposure can be acute or chronic. Chronic exposure has been linked to human liver and colon cancer incidents in some studies. Cyanotoxins are found in drinking, also found not just from exposure to the waters themselves, but it's also found in drinking water. Dietary supplements, interestingly enough, some of the dietary supplements that have um, some cyanobacteria in them, they found the toxin actually in them. So be careful. Irrigation waters, sometimes irrigation waters have been found to have the toxin in them and then the toxins found in the plant and sometimes even in the vegetables that are coming from those plants. Shellfish, interesting enough, have had this other compound, um, beta-methylamino L-alanine, BMAA. And BMAA is an amino acid that has exhibited some neurotoxicity in laboratory tests. And there's been some studies that have suggested that, that BMMA has some association with ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and dementia. So there's a lot more study being done on this, but um, this compound and its association with the cyanobacteria and these diseases is um, an, an active area of research as well. So many people are interested in that area. Now I wanted to leave you with something really cool with these HABs, they're not all bad and ugly. This is something that's very beautiful um, by Alex. It causes this bioluminescence that we see often in our area. And we've got some really nice pictures of the bioluminescence by Alex. Um, these are some pictures that we've taken over the years with um, Alex bioluminescence. So it's really neat at night when Alex is blooming. So. And these are, this has taken a lot of different people to do this work. Um, my colleagues at BDH, Old Dominion University, and many, many of my students, technicians, colleagues um, at VIMS. And thank you. And when in doubt, stay out. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks.
Thanks so much, Dr. Reese. That's uh, it was a fantastic presentation. I'm going to share my screen again real quick for everyone. Just to before we get to questions, please remember to you can go ahead and submit them in the Q and A box. I see we had. Um, one come through that way and a couple of others that they came through in chat that we'll get to in just momentarily. But I wanted to highlight um, the uh, av a couple of advocacy action opportunities. Um, one is that Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action just launched a new uh, action a couple of weeks mm -hmm. ago um, called the Virginia Call to Action on Climate Health and Equity. This is a, a statement of several principles that we believe you know, align the issues of having a healthier climate, um, a healthier uh, population, and um, getting at some, some root causes of the inequitable distribution and, and links between those two things. Um, so the link is there. Please check it out. Add your name as a health professional in support of this. We'll be, um, you know, using this in various advocacy um, for the months to come. Uh, so we want to get as many people signed on in support as possible. The second initiative I just wanted to highlight was that our parent organization, the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, has just um, launched a new initiative called Health Voices for Climate Action. This is specifically this is specifically tied to um, the, the in anticipation of the election coming up this fall, but they're providing kind of a storyteller and media training. Um, uh, a training session coming up next week, and then we'll actually teach you how to kind of capture your own story in a video that then may be used in, in some election-related um, advocacy and awareness raising about the links between climate and health. Um, so those are two of the actions that we wanted to highlight today. And Let's see. And then the last thing I wanted to mention before we turn to questions is just that uh, attending this webinar, um, uh, you can claim CME credits for it through Inova's system. You can see the website here, icmes.inova.org. Um, you can also click on that link uh, next to mm. the image for more detailed step-by-step -step instructions and everyone will be getting a follow-up email tomorrow um, with this information as well to claim that credit. But with that, we'll open it up for questions for um, just a few minutes. So Dr. Reese, if you, um, if you can see the questions in chat and the Q&A box, you feel free to go ahead. Okay, so um, one of the questions is, how easy and quick is it to culture the organisms from human samples, um, stool, vomit, in order to assist with diagnosis? Well, the organisms aren't typically cultured from the human samples. What is usually done is, um, so shellfish, when they are distributed to different restaurants or even sold, they're traced. They always are tagged and traced. So what is done is there's an extensive interview of patients to find out where they have eaten and then a test, they trace back and test the shellfish that have been consumed and determine from that if those shellfish have the toxin in them. So they do it by actually testing the shellfish themselves because you can't really test and they test for the toxin in the shellfish the and sometimes you can find the actual organisms in the shellfish but it's much much better to test for the level of toxin in order to get a definitive um, diagnosis they do it by symptoms and by um, levels of toxin in the shellfish because that gives you an idea about what kind of dose a, a person would have had and it's much clearer that way than to try and do it from the individual. I think they can do blood tests for the toxins in the person, but they can't pick up the organism itself. They're looking for the toxins um, in the people and in the shellfish. And the, then the best thing, of course, is they're wanting to get those shellfish out of the um, stream they want to get them off the shelf and have them no longer being distributed and our shellfish safety um, like the department of health does do intermittent tests and uh, monitoring 
like we're doing monitoring water sampling all the time at these different uh, shellfish grower sites in order to monitor for the organisms themselves. So if we see those organisms, then immediately they would go back and test for toxins. So in the actual field, you're testing one way, you're, test, you're looking for the organism and then testing for the toxin. But if a person would actually present with symptoms, then you would be looking for the toxin and trying to determine because once they've ingested it, you can't, the organism is no longer intact. It, it's degraded, of course, by the digestive tract of the person because of the acids, et cetera. So I hope that helps. Um, <clears throat> there was another question here about are there links between freshwater and the freshwater that leads to seawater? And absolutely, yes. We've seen this where, um, especially with the cyanobacteria that are in the upper reaches, for example, in the years where we've had heavy rains, where we've had cyanobacterial blooms up in the upper reaches of say the James River or the York River, we can detect the cyanobacteria like microcystis down in almost to the York River State Park and below in the York River, for example, or if some of the uh, ponds or uh, thing overflow into some of the um, more saline waters, we can detect those overflow areas where fresh water is overflowing into the saline rivers. So yes, uh, there definitely are links between blooms that happen in fresh water and lead into the oceans. And that's definitely what was happening in Florida with Lake Okeechobee when they would open, uh, I guess it was the dams there that would lead out into the um, seawater. They were, they were definitely releasing the uh, cyanobacteria out to the coastal waters. And you can pick it up all the way to the coast. They were being able to pick that up. Um, and is there, a, is there a way to kill possible contaminants? They, um, in Lake Erie, they're doing filtration to try and eliminate the cyanotoxins that are coming in from Lake Erie. But, um, and some treatments are better than others. That's a, there's a lot of research going into the best treatments that can be done to try and um, eliminate some of these toxins, especially the cyanotoxins that are in drinking water, because that's typically what's happening is the cyanotoxins are a problem for drinking water. So there is a lot of research to try and improve filtration systems for drinking water for the cyanotoxins. Trying to see if there are any other questions. I think, I think that's all the questions. John or Sam, do you see any more questions? I think that's it, Sam, if you wanna close us out. Oh, you're on mute, Sam. Oh, here I am. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Reese. That was really you're fascinating welcome. and uh, um, very, really uh, uh, very interesting. So I appreciate your time so much. And, uh, and you're welcome. We'll close it out now. Thank you, Dr. Reese. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you. Bye-bye.